Hi friends, welcome to my recap of Watchtower Study Article 12, which will be studied at Jehovah's Witness meetings the week of May the 16th, 2022. Let's dive right in. Here it is, friends. Do you see what Zechariah saw? Once again, they only quote half or a portion of the verse without indicating that they're doing so. Notice the preview. Jehovah gave the prophet Zechariah a series of thrilling visions. What Zechariah saw gave him and Jehovah's people the strength to overcome the challenges they faced. Wow. As they struggled to reestablish pure worship. Wow. That, that. Anyway, let's just keep going. Those visions can also help us to serve Jehovah faithfully despite our challenges. In this article, we'll discuss valuable lessons that we can learn from one of Zechariah's visions, which involved a lampstand and olive trees. Well, isn't that interesting? Watchtower is going to tell us about the lampstand and the olive trees. It's going to be interesting to see if Watchtower's definition and explanation lines up with Scripture, because Scripture makes it very clear. Let's check it out. In the green box, paragraph one, there was excitement in the air. Jehovah God had stirred the spirit of King Cyrus of Persia to release the Israelites who had spent decades in Babylonian captivity. The king made a proclamation for the Jews to return to their homeland and rebuild the house of Jehovah, the God of Israel. Paragraph three in the box. Once they started to rebuild the temple, though, those former exiles began to face strong opposition. The surrounding peoples were continually discouraging the people of Judah and disheartening them from building. As bad as that was, the situation got worse. In 522, a new Persian king, Artaxerxes, came to power. Opposers viewed this change in rulership as their chance to put a permanent stop to the building work by framing trouble in the mind of the law. In the purple box, the king believed their lies in order to ban on the temple construction. With that, the work of the once joyful temple builders ground to a halt. Can you see where this is going? Why do the witnesses face strong opposition? Is it because they have the truth? Or is it because they're believing a lie and people are trying to warn them? Listen, the book of Ezra records the rebuilding, the, the, the return to Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the temple. It has nothing to do with Jehovah's Witnesses and their construction projects. All right, let's keep going. Paragraph four in the box. The pagan inhabitants of the land and some in the Persian government were determined to stop the rebuilding of the temple. But Jehovah was determined to keep the building program moving forward, and he always accomplishes his purpose. Read Isaiah 55, 11. Well, there it is. But we're going to start at verse 10. I'm going to read the colored words, okay? For as the rain comes down, basically watering the earth, verse 11, that they cite, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. All right. Well, many people interpret this verse as talking about Jesus. Some people also say it's God's promises, all right? But he talks about the word. And let me just explain. Notice Hosea 6 verse 3 in the center. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning and he shall come as unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. Notice verse 11 at the top in green. It said, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. And of course, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and that's speaking of Jesus. As the rain comes down from heaven, watering the earth, thereby making it fruitful, so did Christ come down as the word with his promises watering people with his grace so that they become fruitful and bear fruit to him. That's what this, these verses are talking about. Whether you look at it as Christ or the word of God, God's promises, it has nothing to do with Jehovah's building projects. 
He raised up a fearless prophet named Zechariah and gave him a series of eight thrilling visions, which he was to share with the Jews for their encouragement. Those reassuring visions helped them to see that they had nothing to fear from their opposers. Wow, do you see that? And urged them to press ahead with Jehovah's work. In the, f in the fifth of those visions, Zechariah saw a lampstand and two olive trees. All right, I want to show you the verses Regarding this, Zechariah 4, 11 through 14, notice what's underlined. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick? Verse 14, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. The Bible tells us about the lampstand and the two olive trees, but the Bible tells us who they are. And then when you chase these words down through scripture, it makes it even more clear. But Watchtower is going to tell us something different. We all get discouraged at times, so we can benefit from considering the encouragement Jehovah gave the Israelites through Zechariah's fifth vision. Understanding this vision can help us to serve Jehovah faithfully when we are dealing with opposition. Why are Jehovah's witnesses dealing with opposition? Why? All right, so Watchtower is going to help their followers understand about the lampstand and the candlesticks, but I can do that as well from Scripture and show you very, very clearly what the God of the Bible says. Back to the paragraph in the box. Understanding this vision can help us to serve Jehovah faithfully when we're dealing with opposition, when we're coping with change, and when we're receiving direction that we do not understand. I want to show you Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 through 7, what's underlined. I will give power to my two witnesses. Verse 4, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Verse 6. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Hmm, who did that? Elijah did that. And have power over waters to turn them to blood. Who did that? Moses. And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Revelation chapter 11 makes it very clear who this lampstand and two candlesticks are. It's the two witnesses, these fire-breathing men who will show up on the earth during the tribulation. You can read about them. It's pretty amazing. It's speculated that it's Moses and Elijah. Remember, Elijah never died. He went up in a whirlwind. And Moses, they God hid the bones of Moses. I'm just saying it's speculated because that may be a hint as to who they are. Because in the days of Ahab, Elijah had stopped the rain. Either way... It's defined, they're fire-breathing men in the tribulation, but Watchtower created a study article. Let's see what they have to say. Notice in the orange box, the oil from the trees represented Jehovah's powerful Holy Spirit, an inexhaustible supply of it. All the military might of the Persian Empire was as nothing in comparison with the power behind God's Spirit. So notice what I wrote in orange. God's two witnesses during the second half of the tribulation will be empowered by the Holy Spirit to shine God's light into a dark world. That, that is what the oil represents for the two witnesses, okay? Let's keep going. In the orange box, what an encouraging message. All that the Jews needed to do was to trust in Jehovah and get back to work. In the next box, the new king, Darius I was ruling Persia in the second year of his reign. He discovered the ban on the temple construction was illegal. Then Darius then gave royal approval to complete the work. Hmm, royal approval. That news alone was enough to surprise everyone, but there was more. The king ordered the surrounding people to stop interfering in the building work. Isn't that interesting? What a coincidence that the Jehovah's Witnesses propose a 1.5 million square foot production complex in Ramapo, moving along, the king ordered the surrounding peoples to stop interfering in the rebuilding work and to provide funds and supplies to support it, of course. Be prepared, witnesses. Watchtower wants your money and your supplies. Build it as much as for free as they can get. Notice the picture. <laughs> it's a man in prison, really. Rely on Jehovah's power when you face opposition. The two candlesticks in the lampstand have nothing to do with Jehovah's Witnesses. Nothing. And now they're showing 
a Jehovah's Witness in prison rely on God's Holy Spirit? We're talking about two different stories, one in the Bible and one in Watchtower publications. Paragraph eight, today too, many of Jehovah's worshipers face opposition. Why? In the brown box, other witnesses face opposition of a different sort. They live in a country where there is considerable freedom to worship Jehovah, but they still face, look at this, opposition from family members who are determined to stop them from serving their God, their God. Not from serving God to stop them from serving their God. When opposers realize that their efforts to discourage their witness relatives are in vain, they stop opposing them. And in some cases, those who were once violently opposed have later become zealous witnesses. You have nothing to fear. Family members are to be feared. Notice on the top that Watchtower uh, number two 2020 campaign that was sent to public officials on all levels of government telling these public officials that God's kingdom will undo all the harm that millenniums of human rule have done. Maybe is that one reason why Jehovah's Witnesses face opposition? You're going to send one of your publications to public officials at all levels of government, telling them that your God is going to destroy them because they're the cause of all harm in the world? Think about this. Think about how crazy that is. That's alarming. No wonder why they're persecuted. No wonder why they're banned. No wonder why they're considered extremists. Their literature contains violent, graphic images of death and destruction. Think about this. Under Coping with Change, Watchtower explains that some of the older Jews wept over the fact that the new temple was not as glorious as the old. It goes on to say the contrast between the old and the new is more than they can bear, okay? With that, paragraph 10 says to read Zechariah 4, 8 through 10. What did the angel mean when he said that the Jews would rejoice and see the plumb line in the hand of the Jewish governor Zerubbabel? All right, well, here it is. Notice verse 10, for who has despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see, shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. All right, in purple, those seven correspond to Revelation 1, verse 4, right below. John, it was written, um, the first part of Revelation was written to the seven churches. It also corresponds to Revelation chapter 11. It's very deep, but I put it there on the bottom, what's underlined, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. And then look at that. Notice verse 3, and I will give power unto my two witnesses. Those two fire-breathing people who shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and sixty days. Watchtower is going to explain this measuring plumb line. Of course, they never bring in Revelation 1 or Revelation 11, which you need those to really see the definition of this. But let's see what Watchtower has to say. Notice in the red box, Watchtower goes on to explain what a plumb line is. It's for determining whether something is perfectly vertical or upright. The angel was thus assuring God's people that as modest as the temple may have appeared to some, it would be completed and would meet Jehovah's standards. Notice this. He would be pleased with it, so why should they not be pleased? Paragraph 11 in the box. Change is challenging for many of us. Some who served in a form of special full-time service for a long time have received a change of assignment. Others have had to relinquish a cherished privilege because of their age. It's normal to feel disappointed when such a change affects us. Notice the caption from the picture in the box. Cultivate a positive view of new circumstances. Do you notice the plumb line hanging in the picture? Watchtower says it's all about acceptable worship and accepting change. That is so far off from what these verses are discussing. Don't be disappointed. Don't be discouraged. Don't be an opposer of watchtowers building projects. I mean, after all, 
We're in the last day of the last day of the last days. So why have all of this building campaign? Oh, but remember the plumb line. Jehovah's not disappointed. So why should you be disappointed? Down at the bottom of the paragraph, what's underlined? And we may become discouraged feeling that in our new circumstances, we are of little use to Jehovah. I don't know. That That's pretty sad. I like to look at 1 Peter 5 or 7. Casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. Anyway, Notice paragraph 12. We cope better with change when we look at things from Jehovah's perspective. He's accomplishing great things today, and we have the unique privilege of being his fellow workers. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. Here's verse 9, which was cited in green. For we are all laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, God's building. Notice verse 10 in red. I have laid the foundation, and another builds thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. This is the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat, as recorded in Romans 14.10. This is clearly speaking about Christians whose foundation is Jesus Christ, not Jehovah's Witnesses whose foundation is Jehovah of the organization. It's the Bema seat where Christians receive their rewards. Christians are no longer under the wrath of God because they've been cleansed by the shed blood of their Savior, the one they worship, the one they put their trust in, not Jehovah's Witnesses who serve an organization. Consequently, if a change in the organization affects you personally, avoid getting caught up in the whys and wherefores behind the change. Rather than look for the former days, prayerfully look for the good and the change. What kind of change, Watchtower? What is coming down the pipe? that you're preparing your followers to face. Notice at the bottom what's underlined. Thus, we will remain joyful and faithful even when our circumstances change. Look at this. When it's challenging to follow direction, the work to rebuild the temple was banned. <laughs> wow. Still, the men appointed to take the lead, High Priest jo Joshua and Governor Zerubbabel, started to rebuild the house of God. That decision may have seemed ill-advised to some Jews. Here it comes. Read Zechariah 4, 12 and 14. There it is. In this part of Zechariah's vision, the angel reveals to God's faithful prophet that the two olive trees represent the two anointed ones, Joshua and Zerubbabel. These two men were represented as figuratively standing alongside the Lord of the whole earth, Jehovah. What a privileged position to be in. Jehovah had confidence in them. Paragraph 15. One way that Jehovah continues to provide direction to his people today is by means of his word, the Bible. In that sacred volume, he tells us how to worship him acceptably. How can we show that we respect the direction we receive from God's word? By paying close attention to it and by taking the time to understand it. That's right. Hebrews 1 verse 2. In these last days, God has spoken to us by his son, the word of God. Not by governing body members, not by an organization. Trust the direction you receive from, look at this, the faithful and discreet slave. I thought God spoke to us by means of his son. Where does this faithful and discreet slave show up as speaking to us today? Read that account in Matthew 24. Where does it say, God appointed them to speak to us today. It doesn't. It's speaking about the servant of a household who took care of things while his master was away. It's talking about the everyday Christian who, while Christ is away until he comes again, performs the roles of a Christian, shares truth with people, provides spiritual nourishment through the word for people. It doesn't mean a composite group of men living in New York ruling a corporation and having indoctrinated followers throughout the world. It's just not there. Paragraph 16 in the box. Another way that Jehovah provides direction is by means of the faithful and discreet slave. 
Where does the Bible say that? Do you see how they slip in their doctrine, their false doctrine? There is no faithful and discreet slave that God provides direction through. It's not there. This is a lie. And Watchtower is telling their followers they must trust this these governing body members who declare themselves to be the faithful and discreet slave. It's not true. All right, Matthew 24, 45. At times the slave may give direction that we do not fully understand. For example, we may receive specific instructions designed to prepare us to survive a natural disaster that we think is unlikely to occur in our area. Or we may feel that the slave is being overly cautious during a pandemic. What should we do if we feel that the instructions given are not practical? The next box. Sometimes God's people received direction that did not appear to be practical from a human standpoint, but turned out to be life-saving. This is so dangerous, and I find this so alarming. These self-appointed men who claim to be Christ's brothers are going to be giving directions that are ma a matter of life and death. And their followers are to obey them, even if it doesn't seem practical. I don't know what these guys are thinking. I don't know what they're thinking, but this is alarming. And um, that that's where it's gonna end for today. Let me know what you think in the comments, friends. I thank you so much for watching and um, stay tuned for more study article recaps. Have a great day.